Hello, and thank you for watching Don't Get Scammed, a program brought to you by the Orland Park Public Library. My name is Ian Lashbrook. I'm the Digital Services Manager at the Orland Park Public Library. And the library thought it would be a good idea, uh, given the current situation, to go over some of the basic scams that have been occurring for a while now uh, over the phone, through the mail, through the internet, as well as some new scams that have popped up uh, during this current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there are a lot of people out there trying to get your information. There's a lot of people out there trying to take things from you. And we wanna hopefully educate you and give you some tips on how to avoid uh, falling for those scams. And even just a little bit of awareness can be really helpful when it comes to things like this. So thank you for watching and uh, we hope you enjoy. With that, let's go ahead and get started. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about here today is um, social engineering. Social engineering is a term that's been around for a while now. Um, in the context of IT and information security, it's the psychological manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. There's a lot of ways social engineering can be carried out, uh, whether through spam emails, phone calls, the traditional mail, uh, as well as technology things such as uh, USB drives left in odd places. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that can go into social engineering, but the whole idea is that someone else is manipulating you or an institution or a group of people into uh, certain actions or giving up your information. Our biggest weapon against all of this is vigilance. If we can be vigilant and take our time when uh, assessing communications, uh, we can a lot of times avoid some of the, the, the problem areas that can occur and just outright avoid scams altogether. Um, when we're talking about telephone calls, we want to avoid suspicious numbers and spoofed numbers. Spoofed uh, phone numbers are when someone is able to replicate a phone number and make it look like a call is coming from a number you know. Uh, a lot of times this is difficult to avoid, but the person on the other end, if you pick up, a lot of times isn't quite what you expected it to be. Um, so when in doubt, if you don't know a number, send them to voicemail. That's what I tell people all the time. I think a lot of people may still think of this as something that may be rude or they don't really want to do. Uh, you should really consider this if you don't know the caller, uh, you should send them to voicemail. If you do answer a call and it turns out it's really doesn't sound right or it's not quite right, feel free to hang up. You don't need to continue speaking to someone on the telephone. Uh, the mail, we need to be careful of people collecting or promising money through the mail. This happens a lot. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the specific things that can occur, but Look at, look at your mail and don't fall for those obvious um, kind of get rich quick ideas through the mail, as well as don't just assume that because someone sent you a piece of mail saying you owe money that you do owe money. Another one that's big are fake emails. Um, fake emails are harder and harder to catch. Uh, they can be almost identical to the real thing at this point. So we're gonna give you some ways hopefully to find uh, and decipher a fake email from a real email. Some other things to consider, browsing the internet. Are you using the right browser? Uh, a lot of people use a browser out of convenience, um, out of feeling comfortable with that browser, but that browser may be insecure. Uh, are the sites you're browsing secure? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And have you looked at your social media security? Security settings for social media are, they're, they're gigantic, there's a lot of them, they can be very confusing. We're gonna give you a couple, hopefully very simple ways that you can lock down your social media. And finally, password management. The key is to know the difference between important and not so important passwords. Some passwords you need to be very, very careful about how you manage them. And other passwords, it's okay uh, to be um, a little less careful. You should be careful with all of your passwords, but you need to know the difference between the ones that can really, really um, hurt you if someone else gets a hold of them and the ones that aren't as consequential. So let's go ahead and start with telephone calls. Don't answer calls from unknown numbers. Uh, again, I think some people still think of this as rude that you owe it to the person on the other end to pick up the phone. You don't. You do not need to answer calls from unknown numbers. If it's important, they will leave you a message and you can call them back. Send them to voicemail. Um, I really can't uh, kind of stress this enough. This is an option, it's okay. If it's an emergency, they'll leave a message. Uh, so send, send them to voicemail if you don't know who they are. 
Beware of emergency calls asking for personal information. This has become a more popular scam where someone calls claiming to be a, you know, a grandchild or a son or daughter, and they need your personal information because they're in an emergency situation. Be very, very wary of those types of emergencies. Do they occur sometimes? Yes, they do. Uh, but they are also kind of preying on your fear and, and your worry for your children or family members. So be aware of them. Be a little skeptical. Um, make sure if you're giving out information over the phone that you know exactly who you're giving it to. Is there an awkward pause at the beginning of the call when you answer it? Hang up. A lot of times call centers um, have a delay because a call center employee is actually calling anywhere from 10 to 20 people at the same time. And the first one who picks up is the person that gets connected. But there's a kind of a second or two before that person goes live on the other end. If that happens, hang up. A lot of those calls are either um, they're designed to get you to agree to something or they might be uh, some sort of uh, get rich quick scheme, anything like that. Um, you just want to stay away from that type of call. Just go ahead and hang up. Never say yes or your name at the beginning of a call. This is something that um, call spammers have uh, and scammers have kind of figured out. It's a way to get you to agree to something without you necessarily knowing what it is. Uh, again, if you don't know who's calling, don't answer the phone. And you can, of course, still put your number on the no call list. This is effective, but not the greatest thing, um, it's still a good idea to add your name to the no call list. So how about traditional mail? Uh, you didn't win anything. I know, everybody thinks that they've won something. They want that money, that prize. Um, this kind of preys on those fears of not having enough, um, things like that. It's incredibly rare that you win something through the mail. Beware of checks that come in the mail from unknown sources. A lot of times these are, these are loans, and by cashing the check, you're agreeing to an incredibly high interest rate on the loan. Watch out for second notices or other important looking bills from companies or people you do not know. Uh, this is kind of a mail tactic. You've probably seen it. Uh, a company sends you something that looks official, uh, but it really isn't. It may say second notice on the outside, things like that. Uh, this is just more scams, more spam, things like that. Be suspicious of any mail that demands you owe money. Uh, I've seen this happen to a lot of people. Uh, they get what they assume are collections notices in the mail. And these collections notices aren't real. Um, they're from another group. They're from somebody else who's trying to get money out of you when you don't owe money. If you receive one of these notices, check with your credit agencies or your bank and see if there actually is a collections out on your name. It's a very simple thing to do to make sure that you're not overreacting to something that's not even true. So let's go ahead and move on to internet browsing. So a lot of people probably use one of these four browsers. We have Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, uh, Firefox, and Safari for a lot of Mac and iPhone users. There is one browser that is noticeably absent on this uh, page. Anybody know what it is? Yeah, Internet Explorer. A lot of people use Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer has been the go-to browser for a lot of people for a long time. Don't use Internet Explorer. I know that that sounds like a very difficult proposition. Internet Explorer, you may have been using it for years. You have bookmarks, you have, it, it remembers all your passwords and all of that. Internet Explorer, uh, doesn't receive security updates any longer. It has been an insecure and dangerous uh, web browser for a long time. I would highly recommend using one of the other four web browsers uh, on this slide and not using Internet Explorer. I know that that seems maybe like a difficult jump, but there are ways to move your bookmarks and other things over from Internet Explorer so that you don't lose any of that information. Does the site that you're navigating on have security. Every site that you're going to interact with should say HTTPS at the beginning of its URL um, at the top of the page. The S is security. You want to make sure, especially if you're sharing any personal information at all, uh, if you're buying anything using credit cards, that that HTTPS is there. If the site that you're on doesn't feature that S, you need to move on to a different site immediately. 
Um, insecure sites are a really easy way to have someone hack you and find information about you, get into your computer, um, gain access to your credit card, all of those things. Please make sure that that S is there for pretty much any site that you navigate to, um, but especially if you're sharing any personal information online. This one, uh, we're gonna take a little bit more time with because it's a little more difficult. A lot of people are on social media these days, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. There's a lot of social media out there and they do have very robust security settings. The problem is, is that they're too robust in a lot of cases. You have to take a lot of time kind of wandering through them uh, to make sure that you're, make, you're, you're keeping everything private or as secure as you want it to be. Um, with social media, for instance, on uh, this particular picture, this is a Facebook uh, message sent to somebody talking about someone wants to send you a payment via Facebook for $100.12. As you can see down there at the bottom, they've spelled Facebook differently. Also, uh, while Facebook is attempting to create its own cryptocurrency that will allow users to exchange money back and forth, typically Facebook doesn't uh, directly process payments, at least not right now. So this isn't a thing. And of course, you want your friend there to send you that money because $100 sounds really good to anybody. Uh, this is a fake uh, scam designed to get you to give up your Facebook login information. So let's talk about some of the ways you can lock down that social media. Use vague usernames, not any full part of your real name. This goes for email addresses too, if you're making a new email address. Try to use only a portion of your name, um, random numbers, not like your birth year, which was popular for a lot of people for a long time. Uh, try to find a username that isn't directly related to your name and your personal information if you're going to be on social media platforms. Be sure and limit your posts and activities to your friends, your followers, uh, whichever platform you're on, the people who you're engaging with. If you're, if you're not careful, your posts can be seen by people by other people outside of that group. For instance, if you're creating a Facebook post, you have the option of deciding who sees it. All of the Facebook posts that I make are only viewed by my friends, people that I am aware of and I have explicitly friended on Facebook or accepted their friend request. If you do friends of friends, what you're basically doing is assuming that all the people you know have the good habits you do about picking and approving friend requests. That's not always the case. Um, some people may be much less discerning and accept any friend request and now your post is being seen by those people who you do not know. So be aware of how you share your media on social media. Uh, try to control who's seeing it. And there are some simple things that can allow you to do that built into these platforms. Activate two-factor authentication. We'll talk about this more later, uh, but this is really important. Any service that you're using that has this feature, you should be using it. Yes, it can be very annoying, I understand that. We'll talk about it, uh, like I said, a little bit more, but you should be using it if the platform, the software, uh, the website offers it. If anything suspicious occurs on your account, for instance, your, something goes up that you don't remember posting, your, your profile picture changes without you changing it, change your password immediately. Log in, change your password. It's, uh, it's likely that somebody has gotten into your account. A couple more things about social media. Beware of false accounts, messages from people you don't know. If you don't know them, ignore them. This is kind of like the same as the phone calls. If you don't know the number, send it to voicemail. If you don't know them, ignore them on social media. Um, you do not want to get tangled up with someone who's trying to scam you. This is kind of an odd one that I don't think a lot of people realize. Stay away from social media surveys. Uh, things like post pictures, make and model of your first five cars. Post pictures and names of your first five pets. Uh, name the first five towns you lived in. These questions a lot of times are created by people and they try to get these surveys to go viral and a lot of them do. You've probably seen your friends fill out surveys very similar to this. These questions are oftentimes the questions used to authenticate your account. So what you're basically doing is allowing people to reset your password or reset your email address, um, your, your communication uh, email address that's used for the platform. 
you're compromising that because you're giving them the answers to the questions that a lot of these platforms use to verify you are who you are. Stay away from these types of surveys. They're designed to socially engineer you to give up personal information by making it look like you're just filling out a fun survey. And look out for odd social media behavior from people you do know. They might have been hacked and they might not realize it. Everyone should, you know, if, you, if your brother or your mother or your father or grandparent, if something odd is going on on their social media account or their email, give them a call, let them know, uh, maybe help them reset their password because the longer that person stays in there, the longer they can um, kind of data mine, find information about that person and possibly get into other accounts as well. You wanna get that person out of there as soon as possible. So let's talk about email scams. Um, phishing is the big one. Phishing is designed to fish information out of you. Um, <clears throat> so right now with everything that's going on, it's not the time for chain emails. Um, please don't forward emails onto people. Uh, you get those big, long subject lines with forward, 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 FW eight times or whatever. Don't do that because a lot of times those emails can contain um, malicious bits and pieces and they can look suspicious to a lot of people. We just want to stay away from that in general. It used to be a lot of fun to forward chain emails and things like that. We shouldn't be doing it anymore. No one is trying to send you free money. This is actually covered in an episode of The Office where Michael sends money to a prince in need of money so that the prince can send him money. Um, no one's trying to send you free money, at least not over email. Um, these, these scams, I mean, there are real people on the other end of them. If you reply, they will reply back and they will try to get you to either buy things, uh, send them your personal information, uh, give them access to your accounts, all with the promise on the other end that you will receive something in return. You will never get that thing. No one's trying to send you free money. Be on the lookout for friends and family who've been hacked. We've kind of already talked about this. Yes, it's important that you pay attention to your own accounts, but look out for other people too. Uh, especially people who may be vulnerable to scams, who may not have the knowledge or kind of the instinct for, for um, you know, bad emails, bad communications, bad phone calls, mail, uh, help people out. Especially right now, I think everyone is really trying hard to help each other out as best we can. This is one way you can do it from a distance without needing to be right with someone. If you feel like someone, like a family member or a friend has been hacked or had their information compromised, reach out to them, let them know so that they can take the steps to remedy that situation. Do not download attachments from people you don't know. Attachments, especially in personal email, can be very dangerous if you download them or they come from someone who you're unfamiliar with. Um, a lot of times they'll be presented as emergencies or someone trying to give you money. Um, something that makes you, that kind of preys on your emotions. We don't want to download attachments from people we don't know. And this kind of goes along with it. If you can, send links instead of attachments. If you can upload your photos to a cloud service like OneDrive or something and share a link to those photos, that's a lot safer for people than saying uploading 50 photos and attaching them to an email. Um, it's just a little bit safer. If you wanna share a video you found of someone uh, or of something that you think is interesting, send the link to that video. Don't download the video and, and attach it to an email. Personal information, your passwords, account information should not be exchanged over email. Um, in some maybe very rare circumstances, this is okay. Typically, you wanna stay away from sharing these things on email because if someone gets into your account, all of this information is there, whether it's in your sent folder from an email you sent, uh, or it's there as you know, someone writes back and responds, and so now your information is sitting in your inbox. You wanna stay away from sending this information this way. If you're, if you're exchanging personal information, passwords, account information, over the internet in any capacity, it should be through a secure site uh, and not through things like email. And watch out for legitimate looking fakes. This is, like I said, harder and harder. Fake emails are all over the place uh, right now. They, they come from every direction, it feels like, and scammers have gotten really good at figuring out how to make you um, click on their kind of clickable things. You want to check the email address. You want to check the to field. A lot of times the footer of an email, which is kind of the bottom, if it looks like it's from a company, 
there's usually some information along the bottom of the email saying that company's contact information, and that's where they'll make a mistake a lot of times. If you get an email from a company like Netflix or Microsoft, contact that company through their website. Don't respond to the email. Uh, if they really did contact you, they'll have a record of it and they'll be able to help you. If they didn't, you'll have kept yourself from responding to someone trying to scam you. So some of the email services out there are good and some are not so good. Uh, let's talk about some of the most popular. So some of the best ones out there are, are Google's Gmail and Microsoft's Outlook. These have been around for a while. I remember at the beginning of Gmail, you had to be invited to use Gmail. Um, these are both good products. Uh, I would recommend them. They are kind of what most people use. A lot of people still use Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo security was breached a couple years back. So I, you know, I'm not super high on Yahoo. I think it's, it's maybe not the best uh, anymore since it's obvious that they did have some security problems. AOL has been around a long time. A lot of people still use AOL. AOL does not have the infrastructure um, and financial backing it once did. So they're not going to be uh, investing a lot of money into as much money, and let's just say a lot, but as much money into, secure, uh, into securing your email as like Google and Microsoft. The ones to stay away from are the ones that come bundled with other services like Comcast, or if maybe you have Yahoo, um, you have an SBC Global, which is AT&T, uh, not Yahoo, sorry, AT&T, uh, if you have an internet connection through AT&T. The reason I say to stay away from these services is that if you ever terminate the service, so let's say you switch from Comcast to internet to AT&T, Comcast is under no obligation to maintain your email account for you. One day it could just go away. So we want to stay away from services like that that kind of pin us down uh, to the other services they come with. So while Comcast may offer you free email addresses, it's designed to kind of give you a reason to stay even if like maybe say your prices change. So you don't want to use those services because if you do switch, they, they have no obligation to maintain them and keep them running for you. So here's a couple examples of fake emails. And again, just to give you an idea of how professional they can look, this one's from the IRS, right? And uh, the URL, for instance, given here is a total mess. Um, it's a URL that takes you to some malicious code that can then go onto your computer. The IRS doesn't email you. The IRS oper operates in a lot more kind of old-fashioned communications, uh, which is good because they're more secure, such as traditional mail, uh, fax machine. Um, if you get something like this, again, this is like getting something from Netflix or Microsoft or Apple, contact them through their website or call them directly. And if this communication is real, they will have a record of it. Uh, but the IRS typically does not communicate via email. This is a really well-known scam that's hit a lot of companies. I personally know some people who've been affected by this. Basically, it's someone emailing the HR person of a company and saying, I need PDF copies of all the W-2s of the employees and that it's an emergency of some kind. Uh, this, has been, this has been a scam for a while. And HR people, people in business, people all over in all different walks of life have fallen for this and sent W-2s with social security numbers, um, tax information to uh, this person. Um, this is actually, this email is a fake of a fake. Uh, the, you'll notice that Stu here is from a company called Know Before. Know Before is actually a testing um, kind of website that helps businesses and other institutions test their staff on whether or not by sending them kind of fake emails and communications and seeing if they know how to respond to them or not respond to them. Um, this has happened to people, like I said, that I know. So it does happen and it can lead to all kinds of issues, um, credit problems. Uh, in the case of the people that I know, their tax return was, was received by someone else. It wasn't received by them. By the time they went to file their tax return, it was already gone. Uh, this is one that I got uh, through my work email. I've actually gotten a lot of these that look like this, especially with this blue bar kind of uh, towards the bottom of the email. Um, these are all spam emails. Sometimes they say I've earned extra points at a restaurant, or sometimes they say in this case that there are new benefits, probably trying to prey on my fear of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and the government benefits changes, thinking that I may click and review my changes 
what they will do though is ask me for personal information if I'd like to review those changes. Here's another one that's kind of um, hitting on the current situation. Uh, this is, you'll notice in the subject there, a coronavirus spread prevention instructions for business and employers workspace. First of all, um, the language here is a little broken up. You'll notice there's an attachment that looks like it's a spreadsheet, xls.xls is a spreadsheet. And if you read the email, business and employer workspace coronavirus outbreak reduction tips, please look in the attachment. Best wishes, MD, somebody. Now, first of all, uh, typically when you're listing MD, you list it after your name, not before. The language, again, is just a little off. It's a little broken. Um, this is the kind of thing that, that someone may accidentally click on because they're looking for tips for their local small business or their home on, on how to kind of secure themselves. It's a big deal. That's exactly why we're doing a video like this uh, for patrons and other folks to, to watch. So this is where we need to slow down. There are some bells here that, uh, that should go off that show that this really isn't quite right. Um, but if you're in a hurry or you're worried or they're kind of effectively preying on that fear, you might skip over those bells. We need to stop, take a deep breath and think about these types of emails before we open attachments, before we go to websites. So let's talk about password security. Oh my goodness, there are so many passwords these days and retrieving them when you forget them is difficult. Everybody wants you to have a password. Everybody wants you to have an account. That's okay. Some of these passwords are really important. The ones for online banking, for email, for my chart with your medical information, Blue Cross Blue Shield, probably Amazon because there's usually credit card information in there. These are all really important passwords that you should be paying attention to and have secure in some way. Passwords for things like Netflix, social media, they're not quite, quite as important. They're not on the same level you wanna make sure that you're very, very careful with pass passwords that have a lot of personal information. Um, bills, uh, banking, and any place where you do a significant amount of online shopping, those are the passwords that you wanna protect. Medical information especially is another one. Uh, passwords to social media and services like Netflix, Hulu, things like that. You can be a little, you know, you don't have to be as careful with, but again, we should be careful with all of our passwords. Uh, your TurboTax information is another example of one that's really popular, or I'm sorry, that's uh, really important. TurboTax is a very popular service. We want to make sure that, you know, if we're putting our, if we're filing our taxes through, through TurboTax, that we have that um, account and password information in a secure space. But know that there's a difference between the ones that are really, really important and the ones that you just kind of need to make sure you keep an eye on. I know that we all have passwords and services and things we've signed up for that we've never gone back to, and we don't remember at all uh, where those passwords and things are. That's okay, that's gonna happen. Uh, don't worry about it too much, but the stuff that you do use, make sure you take care of it and you're careful with it. This brings us a little bit to multi-factor authentication. Now, a lot of people are familiar with the term two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is a form of multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is an authentication method in which a computer user is granted access only after successfully presenting two or more pieces of evidence to an authentication mechanism, knowledge, possession, and inheritance, which I wasn't sure what inheritance was, so I looked it up. That's biometrics. Two-factor authentication is a type or subset of multi-factor authentication. Um, if the service, the platform, the thing that you are using offers multi-factor or two-factor authentication, please, please, please enable it. I know it can be difficult. I know that it can be frustrating. It creates all kinds of problems. Um, it's not as convenient. And a lot of these sites are built around convenience, especially if they're online. Two-factor or multi-factor authentication protects you uh, in some of the best ways that you can be protected. It's basically saying you have to provide two pieces of information from two completely different systems in order to get into the account. So someone may try to hack your Gmail account. It then asks them for your cell phone number. And chances are this person doesn't know both and therefore they will not be allowed in. This is really important and it can protect you in a lot of ways. Is it a headache sometimes? Absolutely but it can save you from hackers and from being compromised on the internet and having some of your services um, accounts compromised. 
please enable it if you're able to and if the service or the account that you're using has that functionality. So what about during COVID-19? We've seen a huge rise in scams right now. There are a lot of people trying to take advantage of people's fear um, and all of that. And we need to kind of address what scams right now are really popular out there during this pandemic. The first one is fake charities. There's a lot of new charities popping up. We all wanna help in the ways that we can. Some of them are fake, they're not real. And you need to kind of research any place that's offering, you know, that's asking for money or, you know, goods or things like that. Make sure that they're legitimate because there are a lot of fake ones popping up. Medicare phone scams, um, asking for personal information. There've been a lot of changes to benefits packages. And we need to make sure that when we're speaking to someone asking for personal information, that we're speaking to the actual organization. If you get a call or an email or contacted through social media or something like that, reach out to that organization, claiming to be an organization, reach out to that organization through their actual website, through their actual phone number. Don't respond to the communication you receive. Relief payments uh, from federal agencies. We know that these are coming and some people are pretending to have them already. Uh, be aware that, that you know, in a lot of cases they have not been delivered yet. Um, we want to make sure that, that if we're receiving a relief payment or something like that, that it's coming from the right person and that it's not somebody just trying to kind of get us into a conversation and get information out of us. Lottery and sweepstakes scams, a lot of people, a lot of people are worried about money right now and that's completely understandable. So there are going to be a lot of scams saying you won. I hate to be the person to tell you, but you probably didn't win. Uh, research anytime you're told you won something. If you do think it's legitimate, research, 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 contact that you know group, agency, whatever, through their official communication channels before you go responding to anything you receive. Home test kits and miracle drugs. We've seen a lot of this, the government telling people to stop uh, selling um, particular products when those people are pretending like those products can help you in this current pandemic. Uh, it's happened to a couple of kind of prominent figures. They've been told to stop advertising that their product can protect you from COVID-19. And there are a lot of people offering home test kits that are not actual test kits or readily available to the public. Also family member emergencies. Someone may call pretending to be a, a grandchild uh, in an emergency. If you have family members who are in the armed forces or stationed overseas, maybe they're calling and you know they, they pretend that they're them and that there's an emergency and they need money because something's gone wrong. This is very popular. Uh, it preys on very specific demographics, um, folks who, again, are emotional right now and who want to help people and are scared for themselves and their family. Uh, please don't be taken by these. Contact that person directly. Um, or take a minute and think, you know, does this really sound like this person? Is this the right phone number? Uh, don't allow your fear or your emotions to drive you to a poor decision. Also, there's a lot of census-related fraud right now. People pretending to be census workers, asking for personal information. The census is going on right now. I think kind of it's been a bit overshadowed by everything else happening, uh, but there is a census and there are people pretending to be involved in the census. And because it's maybe not in the forefront of our minds right now, we may take it for granted and we may fall for a scam like this because we weren't really paying attention. Some more scams to look out for, bank emails. Unless you have it specifically set up, your bank should not be sending you emails about your account. They might send you statements, they might send you an email every time your, your bank account is used. Uh, but they shouldn't be sending you personal communications. A lot of times that's done through the secure section of your bank's website when you're logged in. Fake customer emails. Right now, if you own a business, you may get flooded with fake customer emails asking for login credentials, um, you know, complaining about things. None of it, uh, you know, these things are not necessarily real and you need to be investigating them, especially if you're a small business owner. Since small businesses are, are obviously struggling right now, we don't want to fall for a scam on top of that. Shipping labels, uh, this happens a lot. So many people use online shopping and things like Amazon. They buy things and then they return them. And Amazon has to email you a shipping label if you wanna return something. Well, the scammers kind of send out fake shipping labels hoping that they'll hit someone in that one or two minute span, uh, 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 span where they're thinking about that shipping label. So I just submitted to Amazon, I need a shipping label. There's about a minute before I get an email from Amazon with my shipping label. If a fake email comes in during that minute, 
with an attachment and it looks like it's a shipping label, I might click on it. Uh, that label then is an attachment with malicious software, bad code in it that's gonna get into your computer. Fake bounce backs. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this before, but you get what looks like a message saying, hey, that email didn't go through. These are kind of designed again to get you to email in a different way to engineer you to give up personal information. Just be very wary of that. If you get a fake bounce back, the first thing that should go through your head is, did I actually email that person within the last couple minutes? Bounce backs, if they occur, should happen very quickly. You should send an email and within a minute, uh, maybe two at the most, you should get a bounce back if there's something actually wrong. So if you do get a bounce back, ask yourself, when did I email this person? Uh, did I email this person? And there are so many more out there. Uh, you can look um, online and find all kinds of scams out there. We're just trying to cover the most popular ones as well as the ones that are popping up right now during the pandemic. This is becoming less and less true, but when in doubt, use your phone. Um, if it's an attachment, if it's something that you feel like you think is legitimate, but you still, there's something in the back of your mind saying maybe this isn't quite right, use your phone to check it. Your phone is much less susceptible to bad code, malicious um, content and things like that. You, you can use your phone more safely than say a laptop or a home computer. Uh, same with kind of tablets and things like that. However, this is becoming less and less the case. So uh, while this tip may work for now, and it may work for your situation right now, it may not work in the coming months or years as uh, scammers figure out how to kind of get around that. So one thing I really want to point out here towards the end of the presentation are fake emergencies. Um, this happens a lot. Does someone really email you something urgent? Urgent is not a, a, a um, quick, or I'm sorry, email is not an urgent form of communication. So if you get an urgent email from someone, you should be immediately kind of on your guard and thinking that it may not be uh, on the up and up. If it's an emergency, would they tell you about it on social media? This is another thing. Would someone you know uh, send you a message or a post on social media about an emergency? It's very unlikely that they would. Um, if it's an emergency, wouldn't they leave a message? Remember we talked before, if you don't recognize a number and you send them to voicemail and they don't leave a message, you can probably feel um, much more you know, comfortable with the fact that it's not an emergency. Uh, if it's an emergency, they're gonna leave you a message asking you to call them back. Fake emergencies are really kind of a, a way to, once again, feed on your emotions. There's a problem, there's something you need to take care of, someone's hurt, uh, we need to take a breath and, make sh and, and think to ourselves, is this how people communicate in an urgent situation? Uh, do not share personal information over the phone unless you're certain of the caller's identity. Again, someone calls claiming to be someone you know, telling you there's an emergency and they need your personal information. Think for a moment, take a breath, uh, slow down is kind of what I tell people all the time. Make sure that this caller, this person is legitimate and you're giving your information to the right person. It, you have to constantly be asking yourself, would they really call me? Would they really email me? Would they really post on my social media page? Like for instance, with the IRS, if I owed back taxes and the IRS was trying to get a hold of me, would they really email me? Would they really post something on social media? That's a thing that's occurred. Think about these things. How do these companies, how do these people really communicate and try to get past the emotional response of, oh, there's something wrong. Oh, I have to take care of this issue. And like I've said several times, slow down, take your time, especially if an email, social media post, something like that comes in claiming to be an emergency. Take a beat, take a moment, and really assess the situation to make sure that you're not, someone isn't attempting to scam you. I wanna thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've learned a lot um, in the time uh, that you've spent here today. Uh, again, my name is Ian Lashbrook. I'm the Digital Services Manager at the Orland Park Public Library. Uh, my email address is there if you have any questions about follow-up. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe and healthy.